Hello, and thank you for tuning in to our channel. Before we dive in, we need a small favor from you. Please take a moment to hit the subscribe, thumbs up, and notification buttons below, so you can stay updated on all our latest videos. In the course of the People's Liberation Army's battles, facing powerful enemies with inferior equipment and forces, their strength was countless times less than that of the enemy. This scarcity of steel and abundance of determination became their familiar conditions for combat. It is precisely through tenacious struggle in such adversity that they forged an unwavering belief in victory and a spirit of living up to their mission without disgrace or failure. The meandering journey of 97 years has transformed the appearance of this unit, yet its essence remains unchanged. What about today's close combat training? Let's step into the training ground situated in the highlands and explore how the People's Liberation Army, amidst the storms of 1997, continues to uphold its spirit and traditions in the new era. This camp is located at an altitude of over 3,000 meters. This composite unit, which is stationed year-round in flat regions, has chosen this training location for the year. Their combat capabilities and spirit will be tested in the oxygen-deprived environment of the highlands. Today, within the camp, they are about to engage in a comprehensive multi-subject combat competition. Through this competition, they will assess combat skills, training levels, and communication equipment operation, including the use of hand grenades in high-altitude conditions. Despite having adapted to the highland environment during their training period, they still face a significant test of physical endurance. Throughout the competition, they are constantly running. For ordinary individuals newly arrived in the highlands, even walking faster is not easy. Besides testing physical endurance in the oxygen-deprived environment, the competition also evaluates various military skills. Now, the soldier's task is to convey the simple information on the small piece of paper using flag signals to their distant comrades. No worries. Just a moment ago, I heard the squad leader talking about how he got out of breath while running and couldn't remember the specific content of the hand and foot signals. So, don't be fooled by the seemingly straightforward flight movements. Under the conditions of oxygen depletion and high physical exertion, this task is quite challenging. On this field, the soldiers are constructing individual foxholes. This isn't just a test of physical endurance and skills, it's also about attention to detail in a high-pressure battlefield field environment. Constructing individual foxholes involves maintaining a tactical posture. For instance, while two soldiers dig the foxhole, another soldier must remain vigilant with their weapon. The construction standard includes maintaining the depth of the foxhole and ensuring the soldier is adequately protected within it. When lying down, there should be a chest-high platform in front of them, along with an earthen mound to shield them from bullets. Once completed, it will encircle the entire camp area. Currently, we're observing the subject of grenade throwing in the front area. Their throws are subject to accuracy requirements. In the forward direction, we can see, we changed two things, the score for hitting the outer ring and the score for hitting the inner ring are different. Then there's another point, when they throw, I notice that they always have a gun-like posture. In fact, this is closer to the requirements of actual combat because when you throw a grenade, you need to be prepared to attack the enemy immediately after the throw. Throwing grenades while climbing barbed wire to construct individual soldier cover. We filmed these scenarios in the past with infantry squads from composite units, but today we see these warriors competing, and they actually come from artillery units. 
Regardless of the branch, we are all fighters. We've drawn on the comprehensive training experience of other units, unifying our syllabus and military training subjects for a coherent assessment. In future battles, we may need to fight continuously, so we need to enhance everyone's physical reserves and strengthen combat skills. Now we're at the specialized training ground for this artillery unit, where they integrate personnel and jointly face the challenges of the high-altitude environment. They use self-propelled mortars, which can serve as mortars by firing shells, or they can use shells as howitzers providing flexible firepower support to infantry on the front lines. And today, the target for shooting is on the hill not far from them. Being so close, it tests their ability to directly aim and hit targets within line of sight. For the first shot, to ensure safety, since the gun is still in a cold state, they'll complete it by manually pulling the trigger under the gun. In previous programs, we filmed direct aiming shots, but in those cases, it was with howitzers firing shells directly. Today, the self-propelled artillery crew faces a tricky challenge because they have to use the curved trajectory of mortar shells for direct aiming. The flight trajectory of shells differs from that of grenades. Therefore, during shooting, they need to consider the trajectory and impact point of the shell's flight, incorporating these factors into their adjustments. This is to closely simulate real combat situations, where the type of ammunition or the ammunition issued by superiors may vary. Distinguishing different types of ammunition, we need to derive experimental data and experience corrections in various environments. This way, we can apply experience corrections during combat, reducing shooting errors. To improve accuracy, I thought the first round might be difficult to hit precisely. But unexpectedly, our self-propelled artillery hit the target on the first shot. Truly impressive. Our mortar crew played a crucial role in providing assault firepower support. The direct hit by the second artillery unit got everyone excited, they're all giving their best to achieve the highest level. The second shot from the four cannons hit its target. Although we can clearly see that the trajectory of the ejected shell is highly curved, it seems that everything is within the anticipation and calculation of the gunner's aim. There are two cannons, and they both achieved a successful first shot. Building upon the results of previous area training, this achievement during the assessment process is commendable. I missed one shot, which is a slight regret in this shooting exercise. The mistake occurred during the third shot when locking onto the altitude control mechanism, causing the shell to hit the edge of the target circle. Otherwise, it could have been a perfect first shot hit. If the howitzer unit is the heavy hammer of the combined forces attack, then the next task for this team is to provide a robust aerial shield for the advancing troops. The new integrated anti-aircraft system, combining missiles and cannons, needs to demonstrate its formidable capabilities against low-flying hunters at an altitude of nearly 5 kilometers, countering incoming drones. At this moment, we see the radar on top of the vehicle rotating. Our task is to shoot at the target drone passing through the valley ahead, allowing it to simulate real scenarios better. In actual combat, we often encounter situations where low-flying targets breach our defenses. In such cases, both vehicles need to fire simultaneously, creating a dense network of bullets that leaves no room for the target to escape. We are about to launch. The rotating gun barrels are the trump card of this new anti-aircraft system. Within seconds, it can fire hundreds of rounds, significantly increasing the firing rate compared to traditional anti-aircraft systems. The precise fire control system ensures rapid response and accurate hits, even when facing threats from small drones. 
The new equipment is more convenient, modern, and greatly enhances our confidence in winning modern warfare through air defense training. The powerful yet flexible firepower allows these artillery teams to eliminate enemy strongholds with precision, clearing obstacles for infantry and armored vehicles on the battlefield. The precise and concentrated barrage of steel projectiles instantly neutralizes enemy aerial attacks. Today, I can feel firsthand the impact of these steel fortresses. However, in past war eras, these were combat capabilities that the soldiers of the People's Army dreamed of but never possessed. In this unit, there is a company with a glorious history. Their predecessors fought valiantly in the Battle of Songfeng during the Korean War, facing enemy planes, tanks, and forces 20 times their size. Despite being reduced to only seven soldiers, they held their ground tenaciously. Their sacrifice allowed the volunteer army to ultimately annihilate the enemy, securing precious time and earning the resounding title of the Songfeng Special Operations Company. Today, more than 70 years later, this Songfeng Special Operations Company, carrying forward its proud legacy, faces entirely new challenges on the high-altitude training grounds. And now, I have the privilege of joining them on this demanding journey. Today's first task is this weight-bearing march. Looking at the load, for us soldiers, I'm basically in a lightly equipped state, just a helmet and an ammunition bag. The weight on my body isn't particularly heavy. But for them, not only do they have the backpack on their back, but they also need to carry weapons. Over here, I also see our soldiers carrying this 1120 rocket launcher. Remember how we used to see someone sprinting across the battlefield with two rocket launchers? The firepower is abundant, but when you experience this weight-bearing march on mountain roads, you'll realize that this kind of coolness, this firepower, relies on the strong physical fitness and unwavering willpower of us soldiers. Strong physical fitness and unwavering willpower, both of these aspects I lack a bit. Fortunately, our platoon leader gave me a tip, when going uphill becomes difficult, you can zigzag to save energy. I asked the platoon leader, what if I fall behind? He replied, whenever you hear us singing, that's when we're resting, and you can catch up. But I haven't heard that resting song yet, and the training scenario has already changed. The white smoke represents a contaminated area. In emergencies, we need to test everyone's ability to handle it. Even Gao Yuan Yuan, who normally doesn't struggle to breathe, now has to wear this gas mask. Yeah, I wonder how uncomfortable it is. Is it true that someone ran over there? Do I have to run too? Do I have the gas mask? Wearing the gas mask completely changes the feeling. It's like being in a suffocating state. And now we have to quickly pass through these two zones, I don't want to spend an extra second. During the foot march, combined with sudden attacks in the contaminated area, the soldier's physical endurance is pushed to the limit. That's when the field ambulance catches up from behind. But the soldier's attitude toward this vehicle is pretty consistent, I'll just stick with this. But wait, have any soldiers actually gotten on our vehicle? No, none. Why wouldn't they get on? Hmm. Firstly, everyone wants to prove their strength. Also, during our adaptation training, we've all adjusted to this environment. When we first arrived, did anyone experience discomfort? Yes, some of us felt dizzy. The intensity of the training during our high-altitude weight-bearing march today was quite challenging. 
Besides relying on individual willpower, we can also lean on our comrades within the team. Especially so when facing significant difficulties. After completing several rounds of physical tests, the soldiers must climb this steep cliff. I came up ahead, but I didn't expect them to experience the speed of the soldiers' movements in the midst of fate. Suddenly, I felt that in this lawsuit, they were advancing at a very fast pace. The first team has already come up. Among all the teams, the first team is the most difficult because they have to explore the path first and then climb to the top to set up the rope. The second group and the following soldiers take turns covering each other, actively climbing upwards, providing cover. Even with the climbing ropes dropped by the vanguard team, it is still extremely difficult and dangerous for the soldiers to climb up the nearly vertical cliff. And don't forget, the oxygen content in the air they're breathing is less than 70% of that in the plains. Throughout the climbing process, the narrowness of the rock crevices and the slippery loose soil make this section particularly challenging. With the help of the squad leader, we finally managed to reach this point. Let's take a look at the difficulties our soldiers will face when passing through this point. From a distance, the soldiers' climbing movements are clean and powerful. However, up close, I can still see them struggling to find footholds, constantly wary of sand and vegetation on the cliff. The new soldier who just arrived on the plateau encountered trouble. Twice in a row, he slipped from the position in the rock crevice. The first time I attempted to climb, it slipped down. Then I thought I could still make it, so I climbed up again, only to slip down once more. I dare not try again. Looking further ahead at the nearly vertical cliff, I feel a sense of fear. I reported to the squad leader and assisted him in securing the safety rope to his feet. Make sure it doesn't tangle around his legs. All right, step inward, step inward. Everyone step on my shoulders. At such moments, the squad leader's shoulders are the most reliable foothold. Quickly go up. As his squad leader, I feel responsible for guiding his training and taking care of his physical and mental well-being. After all, climbing is a relatively dangerous subject. My role is to reassure him psychologically and help him overcome this mental challenge so he can keep up. Training like the entire unit, overcoming countless obstacles. For me, both mentally and physically, this is a breakthrough. If I don't climb to the mountaintop, I won't know what the view is like up there. I want to become a soldier like the squad leader, scaling treacherous cliffs and facing dangerous enemies. Here, the assault team's mission is to capture the trench guarded by the blue forces. Dealing with this new type of combat scenario requires using the latest combat techniques. Besides the unmanned aerial drones in the sky, I also saw the silhouette of unmanned ground vehicles. They went to that stone over there, then turned right again and right again. With the reconnaissance from the previous drone, we already have a rough idea of the enemy's force distribution in the trench. Now, with this unmanned ground vehicle, it can perform the most dangerous reconnaissance work for us, acting as our frontline scout. It seems that we've formed a situation somewhat similar to catching turtles in a jar. After completing the encirclement of the enemy position through coordinated efforts of both human and unmanned systems, our soldiers need to infiltrate the trench. This is the most critical and perilous part of the mission. Precision is crucial. Not only do they need to find gaps in the trench, but they also have to throw grenades first to ensure safety before entering. The confined space inside the trench is suffocating. This moment tests both technical skills and courage. When faced with injuries, remaining calm is essential for survival. Just now, I saw that the blood pressure tourniquet was quite useful. In about a minute, we completed the on-site treatment. We engaged in another firefight with the enemy ahead, and both sides are now at a standoff around the corner. It's time to call for aerial support. The first attack was evaded by the enemy, and the crisis is not yet resolved. With our current unmanned equipment, we can closely observe where the enemy is and precisely engage them. It's interesting, I used to see scenarios like this in movies. Now, I can operate these unmanned systems firsthand. Our military has made remarkable progress. There have been changes in our equipment. Additionally, our training methods and conditions have become more rigorous, resulting in noticeable improvements in training effectiveness. Emerging from the baptism of the battlefield, this honorable unit has risen from the ashes. 
Today, they face the enemy with more powerful and efficient means. However, even in times of crisis and difficulty, we can still sense the unwavering strength within them. All right, follow me. Even though the days of enemy exclusive steel and gasoline bombs, as well as fighter planes and cannons, are gone, bravery and determination remain their most formidable weapons. Whether in daily training or during missions, they strive for the highest standards, just like our predecessors did when accomplishing seemingly impossible tasks. Through rigorous training, combining the spirit of Son Bonian with modern technology, they've developed stronger combat capabilities. They've honed their courage and skills in harsh environments, forging a sharp blade that can overcome any challenge. They aim to achieve the centennial goal of building the military and become the most admirable people of the new era. I've never felt so inspired by a song. Not only does it reflect the spirit of our soldiers, but it also means that the main force is taking a break, I can catch up with them now. The wind blows, and only countless footsteps pass by. Tears flow through the night, and our beautiful homeland remains steadfast. I guard the land, leaving no inch unclaimed. Beyond the horizon lies our precious homeland. We won't yield an inch, we won't allow anyone else to destroy it. Victory lies in the battlefield, and we'll be the ones to secure it.